Hello. Hello. Good to see you. <laughs> hey, finally. Finally, we made it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I had to cancel on the short notice. No That's worries. Great. No worries. And uh, thanks for the flexibility. We actually rescheduled it really quickly. So appreciate it. Thank you for allowing us to reschedule. Not at all. And I'm glad both of you are here. So uh, I guess we're all in the same time zone. Uh, I think. Where are you at the moment? Are you in Sweden? Yes. Excellent. So I'm a little more south. I think it's a little warmer here. I'm in Macedonia. Yeah, that sounds warmer. <laughs> <laughs> How has it been over there uh, this month? Yeah, it's 10 degrees or so. All right. Well, we're a little higher. We're at about 25 today. But... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I can live with that. <laughs> Tomorrow I'm heading to Leiden and then I'm heading to Montreal. So it's going to be getting progressively colder. Yes. <laughs> Quickly, too. So very good to see you both. Uh, I'm going to start this interview with the most important question, which is, Philip, how do you pronounce your last name? <laughs> okay, so I'll do this once uh, for prosperity. So it's pronounced Szczepankiewicz. Szczepankiewicz. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> and I guess it's a Slavic last name? Yes, it's Polish. And uh, then what brought you to MRI? What did bring me to MRI? So I, we, we had like this, uh, um, what is it called? Not project week, but sort of walking around uh, uh, one week at a time at different departments at the, at the hospital. So I was studying to become a medical physicist. Random walking around. Uh... Yes, randomly, very randomly. And quite randomly, I, I came upon Yimilet, uh, who b later became my, my first supervisor. He showed us uh, diffusion tractography or something like that, and it blew my mind, and that was it. And how long have you been working with Marcus? Ever since, actually. So <laughs> Yimmy was my, my first supervisor, but Marcus, uh, I, yeah, I got to know Marcus already back then. Um, so ever since then, so that was 2013? Yeah, 12, no. 2012. Yeah, something like that. Well, Marcus, you must be doing something right. <laughs> what is your uh, road to uh, where you are at the moment? Uh, it's been long. Um, I started back in 2006 uh, doing my master thesis here, uh, implementing a stimulated echo sequence for diffusion with variable diffusion times. Cool. Um, and um, I had a friend who met our, uh, our professor who led the department back then um, in Erlang in the, at the Siemens factory there. Mm -hmm. Uh, and she convinced him that she would be allowed to do a master thesis work in his group. And then after a while, she came and said, look, I have a friend who also likes MRI. <laughs> can, can we bring him in as well? Uh, and they were quite reluctant to bring me in, but uh, in the end, <laughs> they, they did. So. Well, I'm sure they haven't regretted it. Uh, seems like you're doing well for yourself in your group. It worked out fine. Yeah. So uh, then, then, you know, I, I did what I shouldn't do. Um, I went against all the career advice you can get in academia of, you know, moving around, doing a postdoc elsewhere and so on. So I stayed on, did my PhD here, um, uh, was staff scientist for a while, and now I'm uh, faculty. Before we see the audio slides, uh, I would like just to ask one uh, very general question, which is, uh, can you explain the concept of concomitant gradients for our viewers? Uh, what are they? Why are they important? And uh, why are they a problem? Actually, to me, let me, so to me, they are the Baba Yaga of MRI. You know, sometimes you see something being wrong and people just pull either eddy currents or concomitant fields or something like that out of the air. And they are the placeholder for some explanation that will, you know, make it work later on. Um, so that's how I knew them before this project. It was something in the background, something going wrong. Uh, in very simple terms, um, I'd say that concomitant gradients are always there. As soon as you want a linear gradient, you get something else on top of that. And as we say pretty clearly in the paper, that if you design things to be symmetric around the 180 pulse, these if, uh, the effects due to the concomitant gradients tend to um, tend to negate each other. So they are always, always there, but you can make their effects be uh, sort of remove uh, themselves from, from either side. 
that's, I think, the easiest way of explaining it without sort of going over what I said in the presentation uh, again. Thank you. Marcus, anything to add to that? No, other than I, I have no clue exactly how to derive them. <laughs> uh, you know how to few, correct for them. Yeah, there's a few very nice old papers. I, I think it's one from Bernstein, it's 97. Mm -hmm. With mother, yeah. Yeah, that goes through in very much details. Um, and and when, when we first started with this, I remember seeing some equations that were kind of complex looking. And I thought that, well, there must be a simpler way of expressing this. There must be some matrix multiplication, some vectorial math that would just simplify these expressions. And then I went to read through this paper and I thought, oh, <laughs> this was a bit more challenging than I thought. <laughs> Well, that sets the stage beautifully for the audio slides. So now we're going to go and take a look at them, and then we'll come back for a brief Q&A. Hello, everyone. My name is Philip Stepankiewicz, and I will be highlighting a paper for you called uh, Maxwell Compensated Design of Asymmetric Gradient Waveforms for Tensor Value Diffusion Encoding, uh, which was written by myself, Carl Frederick Weston, and Marcus Nelson. The problem that we will discuss today and solve is that all gradients that we apply also come with their concomitant gradients. Uh, in the case of symmetric gradient waveform designs, such as the Stasekel Tanner experiment shown here, the desired gradients are symmetrical around the 180 pulse, and the concomitant gradients are also symmetrical around the 180 pulse. So whatever dephasing the concomitant gradients cause is going to be canceled because of the symmetry. The problem really appears when we leave the safety of symmetric gradient waveforms and start using asymmetric gradient waveforms. And what I mean by asymmetric is that they're not identical on either side of the 180 pulse. And we use them because they're much more efficient and we need that efficiency in tensor value diffusion encoding. Here we see an example of an asymmetric gradient waveform, uh, which might cause a problem. So this is double diffusion encoding in a single spin echo where we apply the bipolar pulses along X and Z. These cause concomitant gradients to appear that do not cancel uh, because they are left with a residual zeroth moment at the end of the encoding. So we have signal loss because of diffusion encoding, and we have signal loss because of this additional dephasing, which acts as a confounder, and this is a huge problem. This has been studied in other uh, fields of MRI, but we're going to take a look at it specifically for tensor value diffusion encoding, and we're going to propose a solution for this issue. Just to convince you that this is a real world, world problem that, that can really punch through in the data, we can take a look at this simple experiment. This is again the double diffusion encoding in a single spin echo. And if we apply this to an oil phantom, we can see that already seven centimeters away from the isocenter, we can have complete loss of signal. This means that all of the signal is dephased, not because of diffusion effects, but rather because of the residual moment from the concomitants. So this is a true and large effect. We have described the theory uh, in the paper here. Let's just briefly survey it again. The concomitant gradient uh, that will appear, we can approximate that by this function. It scales inversely with the main magnetic field strength, and then it depends on self squared and cross terms of the gradient waveform with itself. It also projects onto a vector which describes the position relative to the isocenter. So we know that the error will be zero in the isocenter and uh, increase as a function of distance. We have proposed in the paper that we can use a minimization of the so-called Maxwell index. So if we can make sure that this Maxwell index is small enough, we know that the gradient uh, will be such that its concomitant will always be very small or negligible. The Maxwell index is, uh, is a scalar, which is the square root of the trace of the M matrix um, multiplied by itself, where the M matrix is some sign specific outer product of the gradient uh, with itself. To test if our solution works, uh, we created a very sensitive experiment uh, where we measured the signal in oil as a function of B value and uh, diffusion encoding direction. Here we have a reference where we use the Stasekel Tanner experiment. We know that this is a very robust experiment and does not suffer from concomitant gradients. 
and we can see that the bias that we estimate here is zero. We also created references to other waveforms proposed in the literature. Uh, we have uh, linear encoding with uh, slightly asymmetric waveforms that take care uh, that use all of the encoding time uh, that is possible. So they increase the efficiency slightly, but they also introduce these concomitant gradients. Uh, we also take a look at our old uh, numerically optimized waveforms. This is uh, in the middle here. We have a planar and spherical tensor encoding, and these also suffer from these effects. And finally, again, we have the double diffusion encoding experiment where we can see that uh, the signal loss is really apparent very close to the isocenter. Uh, on the bottom row, we can also see that these are functions of the b-value because the b-value uh, um, changes when we change the um, amplitude of the gradient. So here we have uh, cases where the signal should be within the within the broken red lines, but where it depends both on b-value and direction, which is a major confounder in diffusion encoding. Our waveforms where the Maxwell index was minimized show none of these uh, issues. They, the signal falls within the tolerances that we measured from the reference experiment, and the bias maps uh, simply don't show any of these issues. So we can conclude that when using asymmetric gradient waveform designs, the concomitant gradients can really have a large impact on our final data. Uh, it's especially true for strong gradients, long encoding times, thick slices, and large FOVs, but also combinations of those parameters, which aren't that obvious. Since this is all quite complicated, we have published online and open source a framework where the effect of the concomitant gradients can be simulated for uh, any experiment. So you can go in there, feed in your experiment, and see if this is going to be a problem. In this paper, we have demonstrated and developed a design scheme that removes the bias due to concomitant gradient effects having a residual moment. And uh, this is also at a fairly low cost in echo time. Uh, this uh, solution has been uh, implemented in the numerical optimization framework. So this is also available for you in open source online to design your own waveforms. As a final example, I just want to show you that even in vivo, we can see the difference between Maxwell compensated and non-compensated gradient waveforms. In this case, uh, as a function of, the, of Z going from the bottom to the top of the brain, we can see that we have regions where up to or even above 60% of the signal is lost at a B value of 2000. So this is a huge effect. And of course, this has an impact on the parameter maps that we calculate. For example, the micro FA is overestimated due to the loss of signal that isn't a diffusion effect, but rather an effect of concomitant gradients. I want to thank you for listening, and I want to thank all of my colleagues that contributed. Thank you very much. So I guess the, the, the obvious uh, question here would be, how easy is it to implement this correction, both on the scanner and uh, for other people to use it? First of all, I don't think we should see this primarily as a correction. It could be a correction, but the limitation of this as a correction method is that you have to know your experiment extremely well. Uh, I mean, better than I think that most people know their experiments. So, so uh, I'd rather see this as a, as a feature that we can sort of estimate what the error will be and make sure that we design the waveform uh, that we plug into the system in a way where we know it won't be a problem. So for that, uh, we've put up uh, code in open source on GitHub. You can plug your experiment you know, as accurately as you can into that framework and see if it's gonna be a problem or not. And then as, a, as part of the solution that we present in the paper, the optimizer, you can feed in some parameters in there and ask it for a waveform uh, which will not uh, have this uh, concomitant gradients be a problem. So that's how we see the, the solution. But you're right that there are methods out there, and this one could be part of the solution that would retrospectively correct the data because you can just divide by the error factor. Uh, but you'd have to know your experiment extremely well. And you'd also have to know T to star. Yeah, so that's one of the parameters is object uh, dependence, so that's always difficult as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we might also say that uh, we didn't have to do anything with the pulse sequence. 
Um, so once we optimized new waveforms, we just loaded a new text file, ran them, and, and the problem was addressed. So um, it, it's not a acquisition part, it's just a, a, a preparation part yeah. of, of how you design your experiment. And you prepare it once and it works. Uh, as long as you don't change the experiment too much, it works for... for and you did this on a 3T with an 80 uh, millitesla gradient. Yeah. Uh, and with higher gradients, uh, this is even more of a problem. So in a way, you know, you're really setting the stage for further applications of this technique to higher gradient uh, scanners. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I, I can tell you that I'm writing an abstract as we speak. Uh, so we've implemented this in a connectome scanner before. So uh, tweaking the parameters will give you waveforms that are so compensated that not even 300 millitesla would be a problem. But on top of that, we also recently showed, and this is a spoiler, I guess, that uh, if you use this m-nulling, as we call it, so if you calculate this Maxwell index and you restrain it to a certain value, uh, you can actually uh, be robust against uh, gradient nonlinearities in, uh, in the system as well. And for example, the connectum has fairly large gradient nonlinearities. So we've seen that uh, we can actually get through that problem as well at the same time. Cool. So. Uh, but it, it could also be said that at um, preclinical systems where you do imaging typically on a much higher resolution, uh, the, the small voxel mitigates much of this effect. Mm -hmm. Right. And so even if we go to, let's say, a thousand millitesla per meters and do the worst kind of experiment that, that we saw in the paper, which was a double diffusion encoding type of experiment, the errors tend to be negligible when you have these like 100 micron or 200 micron sized voxels. So we should expect uh, some of this work to be submitted to uh, the Sydney conference, I imagine? Yes, exactly, yeah. So that's coming up. Crunch time. We'll see if this video comes out before the deadline or not. Yeah, we'll and, see. Uh, <laughs> but it's in the making. What about multiband? Yeah, right. So that's uh, a neat sort of uh, place where this fits in because um, there is sort of an online correction you could make that in principle just shifts the, the, the isocenter to wherever you want in space. So if you're collecting a slice somewhere away from the isocenter, you can sort of uh, subtract the concomitant field from your waveform and uh, what you get is something that sort of converges to, to a, uh, uh, something that is free from concomitants. So inside of the, the slice, there will be one point which is error free and then as, uh, as distance grows from that point, you get more and more error. And that, of course, is not applicable in the same way if you have multi-slice, because then you have two places that you would want to correct that doesn't work. So this is completely compatible with multi-slice and, and sort of solves that problem as well at the same time. So yeah, we, we run it with multi-slice. Marcus, anything to add? Um, no, I guess the, the related uh, topic would be uh, diffusion-weighted spectroscopy, where you also have large voxels, mm -hmm. which makes the problem worse. So if you ever do... Um, Fusion weight to spectroscopy, you need to uh, control for those cross, uh, those concomitant fields. As well as I, I think if you use, for example, G slider or something like that, where you excite a thick slab, the uh, yeah the 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 phasing through the slice will also be massive. So that that's another method where this has to be implemented. I think. So you've actually made a lot of this code uh, available on GitHub, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm very happy to see it uh, out there. Uh, have you had people try to use it? Do you already have other groups that are trying to implement it on their own sites? Uh, sort of, yes, but I'm, I'm, I'm involved in that. So I sort of put it in their hands, uh, but I've seen it be used uh, successfully from beginning to end. Uh, I mean, the code is obviously not perfect. Uh, it's still sort of work in progress. Um, and you were working with Thomas Witzel? Uh, uh, Yes, so for this code, not necessarily, but uh, Thomas has been involved in other projects. For example, the peripheral nerve stimulation um, predictor for the SEMA systems and so on. So, um, um, yeah, I don't remember exactly how much we've spoken to him about this particular project, but yeah. Uh, but hopefully people will use it. Um, hopefully we've, we've made it sort of easy to approach with examples and so on. But I haven't seen anybody completely that I don't know, never talk to them, uh, use it yet. Um, what about that group in uh, California? 
that had it in their paper, Did they? which preceded this one, which oh. combined it with a recurrence. Yeah, 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 yes, yes, that's an amazing, yeah, that's true, yeah, so um, Grant Yang and Jennifer McNabb. Yeah, at Stanford. Uh, yeah, they implemented it, so they, uh, they used, so this is based uh, partially on um, waveform optimization code from Jens Lund, whom we had a, 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 a collaboration with. And so that code was actually used together with uh, the Maxwell compensation code uh, by that group. So yeah, it, is, it has been used completely. Yeah, you're right. I forgot about that. And Marcus, is this effort to make your work transparent part of a larger uh, effort by the group to improve transparency and reproducibility in MRI? Yes, I, I would say the, the um, there, there was a time a while ago when we also um, merged the code bases between our group and Daniel Topkart's group at Physical Chemistry. And we were doing, uh, we were collaborating a lot and we were analyzing the same data, but from quite different perspectives. Uh, so, so we made quite a conscious effort to um, build a code base that we could use across different labs. <laughs> so for example, we decided to go for SI units. <laughs> Simplified life quite a bit. Um, and, uh, and then we also decided to, to make it available. And uh, from then on, it, it has just seemed as the only reasonable way of doing it. Uh, right now when I'm reviewing paper and there is no code, I'm like, how could I ever relate to your statements and your claims here if I can't go in and check what you're doing? Uh, so so I, I can't really see how, how science will be conducted without open sharing of code and, and eventually data uh, like five, 10 years from now. Well, it's definitely the direction in which uh, MRM seems to be moving. And even the Highlights Initiative will be undergoing some transitions, uh, particularly next year when we want to focus more on reproducible papers. So it's very nice to see more of this work uh, out there. It's very nice to see other people try to use it and reproduce it. And it's nice to see both of you doing exciting research. So maybe we'll get a chance to chat again uh, mm -hmm. about uh, the reproducibility aspects of uh, your work. There is a discussion that has to take place here on how to best share your code and data. Um, in the beginning, we went for a repository that we updated gradually and used in several different papers, uh, which had some benefits because then improvements from one paper came naturally to, to, to another paper. Uh, but now we're going to a model where we m more publish the code paper by paper, which uh, separates things a bit more, but could uh, make it harder for improvements to, to uh, merge on to future projects. Yeah, I, I, would, I would love to talk to you more about that, uh, because we did uh, recently revive MR Hub uh, through the Reproducible Research Study Group. We did write an editorial about the future of MRI research, uh, and reproducibility as the big part of what will push the field forward. And uh, we would love to get more feedback about what works and what doesn't, especially if we propose a format for supplementary materials uh, that could uh, accompany the PDFs of the articles. Mm. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you and I look forward to hearing more about your research. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting us.